Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laurel and Tyler Thompson. It's great to be with you. Mm -hmm. In our prosperous society, money, success, and security have truly become the gods of our age. And chances are many of the people you know obsess about these things more than anything mm. else in their entire lives. Absolutely. You know, Brian, that seems to be a real issue these days mm. because you know, we already have so much. And so sometimes we compromise a whole lot of stuff in order to get more things, mm -hmm. more money. I've seen it recently uh, speaking with a friend, you know, where so much has been lost because of money, yeah. compromising values, their morals, going down a path that, you know, it wasn't necessary except for the love of money. Well, you know, the reality is, is the heart is one dimensional and one directional. And that means that it can only face one direction at the same time. Mm. Very few times did Jesus ever say that there was something that paralleled him, but he said, you cannot serve God and, and mammon, wow. right? So it's basically, you're gonna serve one or the other. Right. And it's a great tool, but it's a terrible taskmaster. Mm, you are so right, Brian. Mm -hmm. You know, today we have a powerful true life stories about people who paid a high price to have money and success. And we have a special teaching with Joe Amaral about the real answers to life. I really can't wait for that. So let's get started with William's powerful story of workaholism gone wild. Take a look. Mm. And it wasn't unlike me to work, you know, uh, 10 to 12 hour days, five to seven days a week. And looking back, I really didn't understand the price I was paying. Um, my marriage took a backseat to my business. And I could safely say that money became my God. William Searles was in his early 20s when he decided to do whatever it took to make a lot of money and have the things that came with it. I was the guy that had everything. I had the big house, the big job, the big car. Even though he was married and starting a family, his pursuit of the dollar came first. He quickly moved up the corporate ladder. And in time, you know, I went from being Joe Stockbroker to Mr. Senior Vice President with several offices under my control, and with that came lots of money. His wife grew tired of taking a back seat while William built his financial empire several times I mean you're gonna regret you know the day will come these kids are small you need to spend time with them and I kept going and going and going Williams drive to make money had turned into an obsession and it's it's a, it's a big cycle and like I said you get not necessarily just addicted to, to making money just the things that come with it and the drive to make more it's like a, it's like a competition it's you know keep up with the Joneses on steroids he dismissed the idea that his pursuit of money was ruining his marriage then in 2000, the stock market crashed, and William lost millions. His reaction was consistent with how he did things. Worry, I mean, I'm not sure if worry is the, the word I would use. I would say it was almost more like a gambling addiction. And when gamblers lose, they have a tendency to think that, you know, brighter days are coming, and they start chasing. And when I started losing, yeah, I was constantly looking for this, for this rebound. William immediately turned his energies to rebuilding his empire. Soon after, his wife left, and they divorced. Uh, rightfully so, she had had enough, you know, and we parted ways. William's plan to make back the millions he'd lost started out legitimately. But William wasn't making money like he did in the 1990s, so he compromised. And I started borrowing money under false pretenses to reinvest that money. It'd be very easy for me to say, hey, I'm gonna borrow some money, pay X interest, make X back in the stock market, and then repay everybody and, and, and go off, you know, until when things return back to normal. They didn't. Still, William continued investing families and friends' money, hoping the market would turn around. But in truth, there would be no payoff. I just got so deep into it, and in order to not hurt one person, I, I went on and hurt somebody else. And uh, it just absolutely spun out of control to a point where it got to the point of no return. William lost millions of investment dollars. Um, you know, when you, when you take a combination of pride, stupidity, and ego, you know, those, th those three things don't normally set well together. Um, I was very dishonest with a lot of people very, very close to me. He realized it was only a matter of time before authorities would catch up with him. And, you know, I just I got to the point where I had had enough and I just couldn't do it anymore, regardless of what the consequences, that I had to stop the train, get off, face the music, and 
you know, and uh, while doing that, face the consequences. On September 20th, 2006, William turned himself in. He served 52 months in federal prison for wire fraud and money laundering. It gave him time to think about his life and future. But the bomb for me was that William Searles isn't the center of everything. In prison, William met Christians and had questions about Jesus Christ. In time, he started attending a Bible study where he learned about faith. So I kept reading the Bible, reading the Bible, spending more time with Christians, and my faith continued to grow. And I just, you know, to me, faith is that absolute sense of certainty that God is who he is. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And we all have access to that through a son who died for all of us, even guys in prison. Eventually, William gave his life to Jesus Christ. He then started the journey of making things right with those he hurt and accepting God's forgiveness. And once you accept that forgiveness, that's the only forgiveness we'll ever need. But, you know, for me to carry that on, you know, for years was right in these people's faces. Uh, really, it, it's, it's something I hope, you know, I want to do everything I can to, to earn that respect back. I'm, you know, still in touch with a lot of these people. Uh, I've received a lot of forgiveness. But uh, at the same time, um, you know, I want to work hard to, to make everything right. After serving three years, he made amends with his ex-wife and reconciled with his daughters. My relationship with my daughters is better than it's ever been. I told them everything, and, and that was probably the single most difficult conversation I'll ever have in my life. Today, William is a successful author and is in the process of paying back the money he took. While he admits he's not perfect, he puts his entire faith in God. I can still consider myself to be a work in progress, and I still struggle with a lot of things from my previous life. Um, I, you know, right now when I wake up every morning, the first thing I do is pray and read my Bible. Automatic. And my relationship with Jesus is more of a, he's walking right beside me. And when I get into these situations, I almost step back, let him step in front of me and say, what would you do here? And don't get me wrong, there's situations where I skip over them and, and make mistakes all the time. But uh, he's right with me. And uh, you know, having him by my side obviously is a, is a huge advantage to where I was before. I love that William said, Jesus is walking right beside me now. And when I get into situations, I realize that I need to defer to him. You know, that was a, a tough lesson for him because just like Bernie Madoff, there was a, a lot of people that were hurt and really just uh, deeply wounded by just the efforts. And he said, I'm paying it back now, but it's been a slow process. And it's wonderful that he's got a relationship with his children now. But I wonder if you're in that area as well, because one thing that you can't get back is time. You might get money back, you might even get reputation back, but you never get your time back. The Bible says, teach us the number of our days that we would gain a heart of wisdom. And many times money is the reason why that we lose so much time because we go chasing after this and chasing after that. But the Bible makes it very clear that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will be added to it. You know, money is a covenant connector. So therefore, what it does do, it's the smallest increment of faith that begins to allow you to come into agreement and say, God, you're in control. It's the law of first things. If you don't give your children to God first, if you don't give your business to God first, you're gonna have strife and contention in that area. But when you give it to God, then he's going to make all of that make sense and come together for you. I want to get something into your hand. The sky's the limit, succeeding God's way. It costs you nothing, but all you have to do is call the number on the screen. And when I pray this prayer, don't wait, spring into action and say, no longer will mammon control me, but I'm going forth with Jesus. Father, now your, your child has made that decision, that choice, and we say in Jesus' name, amen. Call the number on the screen, request it, cost you absolutely nothing. In 30 seconds, a disenchanted son of privilege discovers a new escape. You don't want to miss it. Sometimes, life can feel like living under a dark cloud. The constant drip of difficulties can seem overwhelming, like you're drowning in your problems. But even in the darkest times, there is a solution. It brings light and hope and will change your world. 
Discover the power that comes through knowing how to pray effectively in Pat Robertson's latest teaching, Answered Prayer. Call now and learn how to get answers to your prayers. I got a, a telephone call from my father. I never heard his voice the way he spoke to me that day. He told me that he had some trouble and I had never heard him say those words either and that I needed to come to the house right away. Andrew Wilkinson's father, Wallace Wilkinson, grew his college textbook company into a multi-million dollar business. He later ran for and was elected governor of Kentucky. After serving his term, however, he returned to find his company in disarray, partly due to questionable partnerships, which brought financial ruin to his company and his family. My dad explained to us that he was being forced into involuntary bankruptcy and that his debts at the moment totaled about $480 million. And this was potentially uh, catastrophic. I realized that our lives were about to change um, in a very bad way. Andrew and his brother had lived lives of wealth and privilege for most of their childhoods. Although Wallace and Martha Wilkinson had raised their boys in church, Andrew says he never knew Christ. He began to abuse alcohol and drugs at an early age. I did not understand Jesus Christ as God. I did not understand him as man. I did not understand the plan of salvation. I was spoiled. My brother was spoiled as well. I was immature. I was arrogant. I was insecure. My identity and my life were completely immersed in material possessions, and, and uh, my identity was in things that had no foundation. In 2002, after fighting a long battle with lymphatic cancer, Andrew's father suffered a stroke. One day later, he was gone. My father passed away about a year into the bankruptcy. And my mother and my brother and I were, for lack of a better word, caught in the headlights, you know, holding the bags. <laughs> While his mother dealt with the fallout from the bankruptcy and negotiations to settle with creditors, Andrew moved to the debt-friendly state of Florida to protect what few assets were left from his father's estate. When I came to Florida is when I started to uh, turn to the things that I knew. And what did I know? I knew drugs and I knew alcohol. Over the course of about four years, I went on a road of all-out self-destruction. With no degree, no contacts, and few skills, living alone in a strange state, Andrew continued to turn to drugs. It gave me the excuse to be a victim. Every day was beginning the same. I woke up looking for the next high. My days and nights were centered around escaping reality. One morning, Andrew pulled into a convenience store parking lot and began to get high on cocaine and Valium. I passed out. The manager called the city police in, in uh, Sumter County. They came and found me uh, slouched over in the driver's seat with saliva and mucus and, and fluid dripping out of my nose and my mouth. Andrew was arrested for possession of cocaine and was given probation. When several urine tests for drugs came back dirty, he landed in county jail while awaiting trial. During that time, he and another inmate got into a scuffle. Unfortunately for him, this was the end of the line for me. My father was dead, all of the money was gone, my mother was heartbroken and despondent over what I was doing and how I was living my life. I had lied, cheated, and deceived just about everybody that I could. And here I was, this man was throwing my belongings out into the middle of the common area and insulting me like that. I was a child of wrath and it came pouring out of me. Andrew beat the man in his jail cell until the guards intervened. He was later put in a prison transport van to another county where he would stand trial. Because of the number of stops, the trip took 21 hours. I was transported in a pair of shorts. I had no shirt, and I was shackled at my wrist, my waist, and my ankles. I was a pathetic, defeated mess. I just didn't have the power inside of me to do it on my own. That's called being hopeless. And I had to face the truth about what Andrew had done with his life. And the truth was, Andrew, at the helm, 
had made a disaster out of his life. In the back of that van, Andrew turned to the one he had heard about growing up in church. I gave the first sincere prayer of my life, and I prayed to Jesus Christ, and he answered my prayer. As I sit in the back of that van, I felt forgiveness. I felt the Holy Spirit come into my heart, and I felt the Lord, Jesus Christ, telling me there was a way, and he was the way, but I had to give up. I had to surrender, and I had to focus on the future and going forward in his love and mercy and compassion. Andrew was sentenced to one year in prison. While there, he began studying scripture and seeking out spiritual mentors. When I opened my Bible for the first time in prison, the very first verse I opened the Bible to was Luke 19.10, and it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. When I read that, those words came off of that page and they seared into my heart. They seared my spirit. He immersed himself in the Word of God. He was released a year later. Today, Andrew is a husband and father and finally knows what is truly valuable. This world screams that you are what you have. I have infinitely more than I have ever had in my life. When I look in the mirror, I know who Andrew is. I know what's important. My faith in God, my wife, my little girl, and the knowledge that there is a ton of life ahead for me. Andrew also has a ministry to prisoners and loves sharing his message of hope. I remember what it's like to be hopeless. My mission in life going forward is to share, you're not hopeless, there is a way. And not only is there a way, but life can come to you more abundantly than ever before. And it is through the way of the cross. It's through Jesus Christ. Well, that was quite a story. You can only imagine what that would be like to go through, you know, your family's loss of all its millions and millions and millions of dollars and ending up homeless pretty hard. It also is an opportunity to see what we have placed as the number one spot in our lives. When we lose things, uh, some of you out there may be facing a bankruptcy or losing something in your life that you have put on the throne of your heart rather than God. And here's what the word says in 1 John uh, 2, verse 15. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You know what we have hope of? Of an eternity. And there will be wealth and riches of a supernatural kind up there. But when we place our hope and our trust and, you know, and some of our desires on earthly, fleshly things, it only leads us down a wrong path. I wonder today if uh, you find yourself having done that and you need to make a decision that God is going to be placed back on the throne of your heart. If God is speaking to you right now, your car is not more important than him. That girlfriend in your life is not more important than him. Having sex, um, going after drugs and alcohol is not more important than God. Would you make a decision today to put him back on the throne of your heart? Perhaps uh, this is something that would be helpful to you. It's called a new day. It helps you to get your heart right with Jesus. one 855 700 We'll gladly send that to you. It's absolutely free of charge. Give us a call. Coming up after the break, our friend Joe Amaral with a reminder about the power of the way, the truth, and the life. Don't miss it. As we begin looking at the Hebraic roots of the Christian faith, we're going to see a lot of things that we probably have never seen before. So often we look at Jesus through our Western eyes and 
we can't help it. It's the perspective that we, we have because that's where we live. And we have something called the, the gospel according to Hollywood. And every time we look at Jesus, he's got blonde hair and you know blue eyes and a British accent. And he's so far removed from his original culture, which was a Jewish culture, a Hebraic culture. And he was raised in that. Even his name we say in English is Jesus, but the, the name that his mother gave him was Yeshua meaning salvation. And so what we want to do is we want to go back 2,000 years, go back in time and understand him in his culture, learning that when he said things, he said things with purpose. There was a reason why he said the things that he did. Sometimes he uses analogies or illustrations that we in the West, we don't always understand. But we've got to understand that the people in his time knew exactly what he meant. Let me give you an example. Sometimes Jesus would say things that would garner very little attention. But other times he would say something and the Pharisees would become so upset they would yell at him and want to run him out of the city or the synagogue. And then we read it from our English perspective and it doesn't seem so bad. And we think, what in the world is going on? Why are they getting so mad? You know, once when Jesus was conversing and speaking with the Pharisees and he had a crowd of people around him, which he often did, no, he said, guys, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no man goes to the Father unless he goes through me. And for us as Christians in the West and outside of the land of Israel, that's become one of the, the staple statements of Christianity. Jesus is the only way. He is the truth and he is the life. And it's beautiful and you might have a nice painting on your wall or your office that has that Bible verse, but what did it really mean? What was he saying to the people at the time? In, in, the, in the first century, we had the temple that stood. But before that, if you go back even another thousand years to the time of Moses or even longer, we had the tabernacle. And it was a, a mobile church kind of, if you will. It was a mobile worship center. After God delivered them from Egypt and they were going through the wilderness, they would just set up this tabernacle. And however long God would tell them to stay, they would set it up and they would have sacrifices and they would go through all of the rituals. And then God would say, it's time to move, and they'd go on to the next place. But what we don't know about that, that process is how it was set up. I've had the privilege of being in a life-size replica of this tabernacle in Israel, and it totally blew my mind because what I learned there, I now want to pass on to you. And we're going to understand what Jesus was saying when he meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There was a process of gates that you had to go through before you got into the, the Holy of Holies, that final room. And you guessed it, that first gate was called the way. It was the way into the presence of God. And then the second stage or the second gate was called the gate of truth. For there was, was the Bible, for there was the showbread and the candelabra. And then you went to the final stage, which was called, so you had the way, the truth, and then you had the gate of life. Because when you got to that gate, then the curtains would be open and the presence of God was there. What was Jesus saying? He says, I am the access to the Father. There's no other way. You can follow other rabbis, you can follow other teachings, but the only way you're going to get to know the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is if you follow me. Because I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I'm, I know the Father. I can take you into His presence. May we all be ready to walk into His presence. I'm Joe Amaral. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day. We're here to help you discover life. Welcome back. It's been a powerful program today, and we have a special offer just for you. It's our newest DVD, and it's called Answered Prayer. That's right. Pat Robertson teaches us how to pray effectively so we can see God work in remarkable ways. Pat also shares his own stories about answered prayers and trusting God. Mm, call now, 1-855-759-0700. Become a monthly partner, and we'll send you answered prayer right away.
It would be such an encouragement if you do that now. And we've got some praise reports, and we get a lot of feedback from you, and we are so thankful for that about the show. But uh, we thought we'd share a little bit of the fun with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Robert from New Westminster says, great testimonies of God's power. I always hear people talking about the testimonies. They love yeah. the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've got Nina from Welland, Ontario. She says, glad to hear that you've partnered with the Scott Street Mission. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, Absolutely. Mission. Doing a, a cool lot of one. good work. A lot of work going on. Yeah. And Valerie from Abbotsford. Now, she says, you guys were instrumental in my dad being saved seven months before he died. Wow. Beautiful. Well, we're so excited nice. that uh, heaven got a whole lot closer in his graduation, but wow. we, uh, we rejoice with you. Yes. Um, you know, we can't do this without you, mm. but we enjoy when we get an opportunity to blend faith together. So would you put on your prayer list Sharon, and she's from Fort Simpson, mm. and uh, in the Northwest Territory, she's asking for guidance for her son. And Janice from Markham, Ontario, wisdom, guidance, and clarity. Interesting. Hmm. Father, your word says uh, in Hebrews, oh, no, Lord, I, I, I want to go to an Old Testament verse, Isaiah 11 and 1, that, Lord, that you would give knowledge, wisdom, understanding, might, and the fear of the Lord to Sharon's son. We thank you, and I know that is released now, and it is so in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for, for Janice, what she's asked for. She's asked for wisdom, God. That is a good request. Mm -hmm. I pray, Father, that you would give her knowledge and discernment about the decisions that she's about to make, that you would lead her in the path that she is to go, that she would bow her knee and surrender to you, O oh God, and to your perfect will and that she would follow hard after your ways, Jesus, yeah. and you would show her the way that she should go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, it's so wonderful when we're praying for you, and then God says, no, turn another way and do something a little bit different. So we want to thank you for calling in and also for just making this so wonderful for us to be in your homes. You know, we believe that Jesus speaks today, and the best is yet to come. It sure is. You know, we want to leave you with an incredible power verse. Proverbs 2, 2, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you. Turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Mm, God will be with you. God bless. God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.